his followers. You know, most, well, first let's look at where uh, the belief in this hell come from. It did not come from scriptures. It didn't come from the Old Testament, either before or after the law of Moses. This doctrine came from Egypt, came from pagan beliefs. You know, when the Septuagint writers uh, looked for an equivalent for the word in the Old Testament Hebrew, Sheol, they used the word Hades. Of all the words they could use, they, they named the grave after an Egyptian god of the underworld. Fables. Pagan beliefs. You wonder, why would these Septuagint writers do that? Because the teachings of these Egyptian Jews, why were these Egyptian Jews? Because they had been in captivity with the Egyptians. They picked up their belief systems. Augustine, when when he wrote concerning hell, you may be surprised what he said. He said this seems to have been done for no other account, but it, as it was for the business of princes. And look in Zephaniah three three and see who these princes are. These are the rulers of Jerusalem in the temple city for no other reason but the business of princesses out of their wisdom and civil prudence to desire, uh, deceive the people in their religious in their religion princes under the name of religion persuaded the people to believe those things true, which they themselves knew to be fables. By these means, for their own case in government, tying them more closely to civil society, and driving doctrines to control the people. You know, you, when you listen to Christians today teach on hell, who would have believed that they contrived these doctrines to fool the people? Who believed? Uh, who who did they fool? They, they, the Greeks and the Romans. And in between the Old Testament and the New Testament, the Jews get got involved in it as the concept of endless torment began appearing in the Apocrypha uh, books written in the interim between the Old Testament and New Testament by Jews that were Egyptian Jews, Jews that had came out of the Egyptian captivity. Historians such as Polybius says, since the multitude is ever fickle, full of lawless desires, irrational pa passions and violence, there's no other way to keep them in order but by the fear and terrible of the invisible world, on which account our ancestors seem to me to have acted judiciously when they contrived to bring into the popular belief these notions of the gods and the infernal regions. Writings from those times say things like, uh, talk of in the same spirit, and they praise the wisdom of Numa. 
because he invented the fear of the gods as a most efficacious means of governing an ignorant and barbarous populace. The multitude are restrained from vice by the punishments the gods are said to inflict upon offenders and by those terrors and threatenings which certain dreadful words and monstrous forms imprint upon their minds. It's impossible to govern the crowd of women and all the common rabble by philosophical reasoning and lead them to piety, holiness, and virtue. <clears throat> but this must be done by superstitions or by fear of the gods by means of fables and wonders for the thunder, the trident, the torches of the furies, the dragons, and etc. All are fables, as is also the ancient theology. These things the legislators use as scarecrows to terrify the childish multitudes. I won't get off into what I, what I see as, as uh, the warnings of Christ upon the nation of Israel there in that first century. I know most Christians see it as a warning of hell. I see it as a warning of the destruction of the nation of Israel. And that's exactly what happened exactly within the time frame. Jesus warned them that it would happen. People today have their salvation moments because they fear these fables, these superstitions put forth by men to govern people. They say they have that salvation moment because they do not want to go to hell. And usually their salvation testimony has Satan somehow involved in it. Satan was after them. Satan caused them to get down on their knees and beg to God to save them from hell. My salvation moments is, is the stories of Jesus looking for that one lost sheep. That's what fills my heart with joy. Those kind of stories. The fact that Jesus is the Savior of all men. Those are my salvation stories, my testimony. Not because I'm such a childish believer that I'm going to believe in these ancient Egyptian fables and I'm so afraid that I, I'm going to go to a fiery subterranean netherworld that I have to accept Jesus. And you say, if we don't promote your life, we're preaching a different gospel and that we're bound for this place you believe in. No wonder you run so many people away from the Word of God. And you close up the doors to heaven. You should study. And yes, stand on the shoulders of many, many, many theologians before you. People who study the Greek and the Hebrew. People who seek the truth. You're afraid the truth is going to change your story and your gospel. Shame on you. 